All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the Institute on World Affairs lecture series, the New Economic Order. Today is the last day. Uh, we'll have one more lecture this evening with Hazel Henderson. Uh, her lecture will be Redefining Wealth and Progress. Today's lecture is cashing in the real peace dividend, restructuring the national and global economies for a post-Cold War world. Our speaker is Lloyd Dumas, who taught economics at the City University of New York and engineering at Columbia University before becoming a professor of political economy at the University of Texas in Dallas. He is author of The Overburdened Economy, Uncovering the Causes of Chronic Unemployment, Inflation, and National Decline, and also co-author of The Political Economy of Arms Reduction, Reversing Economic Decay, and Making Peace Possible, The Promise of Economic Conversion. We also have copies of those books available back there. Uh, he's also, for the past year and a half, been working on the Governor's Task Force for an economic transition for Texas, uh, uh, making the, converting the economy from a military one to an industrial one. So if you'll help me welcome Mr. Lloyd Dumas. The past few years have been testament to how rapidly change can occur when a corner is finally turned. The major threat that drove American foreign policy and conditioned the nation's allocation of its key economic resources since the end of World War II, the military threat posed by the nations of the Warsaw Pact, has disappeared. Yet the world hasn't miraculously become a peaceful and harmonious place. Great challenges still face us on a global scale, but the greatest challenges to the security and prosperity of the nation are now economic and environmental, not military. To avoid getting stuck in the past and missing a chance to build a more prosperous and secure future, we have to change our direction as the world changes, as the nature of the problems change. Times of transition are always difficult. They require us to develop a vision of where we want to be and just as important, a practical and effective strategy for getting there. To understand the extraordinary opportunities that these changes in the world have generated for us in the economic realm, we first have to understand the economic impact of the path we have been following. The economy is the part of society created to satisfy the human desire for material well-being. The material standard of living is certainly all, not all that people want or need. There's political freedom and security, spiritual and moral guidance, and so on. People have created a variety of social systems to try to achieve the different goals without attempting to rank them in order of importance or value. It's still possible to recognize that they are in fact different. When society allocates the limited resources it has available to a social system designed to satisfy one of these needs, it's by definition depriving the other social systems of access to those resources. That can't help but affect their ability to achieve the goals for which they were designed. For most of the past half century, under the imperative of the Cold War, along with a number of hot wars, the United States has given priority to the social system originally intended to provide for the nation's security, the military, and its support systems in science and industry. Although the output of the military sector has never been more than 12%, and has often been more, to sit than, more like 6 to 8% of total US output, as measured against our GNP, it has laid claim to a much larger fraction of some of the nation's most critical economic resources. In particular, the use of large amounts of one of the most economically criti critical of these resources, engineers and scientists, has become the hallmark of modern military development and production. There, the number isn't 6% or 8% or even 12%. It's more like 30%, perhaps even higher. These people have tended to be the best and the brightest of our engineers and scientists simply because salaries and facilities have been better in the military sector given their lavish funding. In effect, this means that in 30% of the nation's engineers and scientists, the military sector has claimed 
may actually represent 40 or even 50 percent of the nation's technological talent. But why are engineers and scientists so critical to the economy? The answer is they are the resolution of an important economic dilemma. The vast majority of people in every country earn the largest part of their income in the form of payment for their labor, that is, wages and salaries. Therefore, in order to have widespread and sustained improvement in the material standard of living of people over time, wages and salaries must continually rise. High wages are not a problem, as some have argued. They are the means by which the economy's chief purpose, improving people's material well-being, is achieved for the broad mass of the population. On the other hand, wages and salaries are also a cost for most producers, the largest part of their cost. And if the largest part of their cost is high and rising, that creates a powerful pressure on producers to raise prices. But if producers raise their prices as fast as labor costs are rising, what economists call a cost push inflation is created, and that destroys the value of the higher wages. So if your wage is going up 10% a year, but prices are also going up 10% a year, you're not getting anywhere. There's no improvement in the material standard of living. Furthermore, if that process of costs of labor pushing up prices continues, it will force domestically produced products prices up relative to those charged by foreign competitors. And domestic industries will price themselves out of the market. The loss of markets leads to unemployment. It also leads to imports rising relative to exports because domestic consumers increasingly find foreign products a better buy, cheaper, better quality. And people abroad find the same thing. So they stop buying products produced in your country and start buying products produced elsewhere. Therefore, your people buy more foreign products, imports rise. People elsewhere buy less of your products, exports fall. And you wind up with trade deficits. Non-competitive industries, chronic unemployment, stagnated or declining standard of living result. On the whole, it's not a pretty picture. So the dilemma is this. How can you have high and rising wages and salaries without forcing prices up? The answer to that is invention and innovation, finding better ways of producing, more efficient production processes, better tools with which workers can work, improved designs for products that allow them to be produced more efficiently. Rises in the cost of labor, or for that matter, the cost of anything that producers need to produce, materials, fuels, etc., can be partially, completely, or even more than completely offset by improvement in product and process technologies. And of course, scientists and engineers are the key to expanding technical knowledge base and applying that knowledge to increasing productive efficiency. Therefore, they're the key to resolving the economic dilemma. It's important to note that this is not merely a theoretical possibility that I'm talking about. It's an historical fact. There is little doubt that the remarkable ability of American engineers and scientists to innovate was central to the spectacular record of rising living standards that made the American economy a model for much of the rest of the world, at least until the past few decades. When the US made the decision to vigorously pursue the arms race after World War II, it was simultaneously deciding to allocate a large fraction of its engineers and scientists, among other resources, to the military sector. It's unlikely that the negative economic impacts of such an allocation were well understood. They certainly were unintentional, but they're all around us today. By interfering with the key mechanism that allowed wages and product quality to rise while product prices remained stable. The arms race undermined the American economy at its historic source of strength. The pace of civilian commercial innovation and 
invention slowed as the result of this internal brain drain from the civilian to the military sector. And as a result, our crucial ability to offset costs with greater efficiency of production began to disappear. From a position of extraordinary economic dominance at the end of World War II, U.S. industry slowly lost its competitive edge. By the mid-1960s, there was plenty of evidence that this process was well underway. In 1971, America turned an important corner in its trade with the rest of the world. A remarkable record of 77 straight years of trade surpluses, <coughs> exporting more than we import. 77 years, and that's not an average over the time. That's every single year we ran a trade surplus for more than three quarters of a century. That record in 1971 turned into two decades of continuing trade deficits, importing more than we export, that is still going strong. The American standard of living reached a peak in 1973 and went into an ongoing downhill slide. Within a decade, it was painfully clear that the historic pattern of rising living standards that had indeed been reversed, as real income fell about 5% over that first decade. It's sad to say, but it's true, that this generation of Americans, now in college, now entering the labor force, is the first generation in this country's history that is looking at a lower standard of living than its parents. We have reversed our remarkable record of continually improving the well-being of each succeeding generation. During the 1980s, we managed to paper over the obvious deterioration of the American economy by engaging in what is best known as an orgy of debt. By cutting taxes at the same time we engaged in a large and prolonged military buildup, we drove the national debt skyward. In one decade, the national debt more than tripled and interest on the national debt became one of the biggest items in the federal budget. That is to say, we added in the 1980s alone twice as much to the national debt as we had added in the 200 years of our history preceding the 1980s. By the late 1980s, the interest on the national debt combined with the military budget, just those two items alone, accounted for 85 to 90 cents of every dollar of federal income tax collected from individuals, families, and corporations in the United States. It's not a great surprise that it's been very difficult to balance the federal budget when we're using 85 to 90 cents of every dollar of federal income tax revenue just for paying interest on the debt and for funding the military budget. But it wasn't just the national debt of the United States that soared during the 1980s. In 1980, the United States was a creditor nation internationally to the tune of some $100 billion. That means $100 billion more was owed to Americans by people outside the country than Americans owed to people outside the country. We were a net creditor internationally to the tune of $100 billion, and we had been a net creditor nation every year since 1914, 70 years. By the beginning of the 1990s, well, let me go back a step. By the middle of the 1980s, five years later, we became a net debtor nation for the first time in 70 years. And by the beginning of the 1990s, we were more than $400 billion in debt internationally, in other words, we went from being the world's largest creditor nation internationally to being the world's largest debtor nation internationally in less than a decade. I think that qualifies as an orgy of debt. For a while, this process of running up the national MasterCard bill, so to speak, created the appearance of progress in resolving our economic problems, but it did nothing to address the underlying deterioration of American industrial competitiveness. In fact, it was worse than nothing. All that borrowing 
made it extremely difficult to fund a variety of programs critical to rebuilding the nation's competitiveness, not to mention programs of environmental cleanup or health care, or programs aimed at addressing the tragic problems of drug addiction, homelessness, and hunger here in the United States and around the world. If we had used that borrowed money to invest in new industrial equipment, in a surge of commercial research and development, in anything that's capable of generating new wealth with which to pay back the loans, our indebtedness wouldn't be a problem. But we didn't put it to such use. So we're going to have to pay back all that we borrowed from those outside the country with interest out of our existing wealth. And that will simply accelerate the decline in our living standard. Let me put it to you in a simple way. It's not being in debt that's the problem. It's what you do with the money you borrow. If you went to the bank, you developed a really good business plan of starting up a new business. And you needed, let's make it simple, a million dollar loan to get this business going. But you'd really done your homework. You had a good idea. You knew what you were doing. You organized things well. You sold the business plan to the bank. They give you a loan. They say, OK, it sounds good to us. Here's the loan. They give you a loan for a million dollars. You're now a million dollars in debt. You take the money. You start building the business. You work hard. You get some breaks. Things go well. You start generating new wealth from that business. With that new wealth, you can pay back the million dollars you borrow with interest, and you're still much better off than if you'd never borrowed the money and therefore never started the business. <coughs> So it's not being in debt that's the problem. But suppose we take the same scenario. You get a million dollar loan for the bank. And then you think to yourself, gee, I've got a million dollars in the bank. I can have a good time. So you start traveling around the world and buying fancy clothes and cars and so on. The problem is, for the short run, everything looks great. Your standard of living zooms. But when the bills come due, you've got to pay it back out of your hide. You have no new source of income to pay back that money. If that doesn't work, then borrowing the money is a tremendous disadvantage. Unfortunately, what we did was more like the latter than like the former, except we didn't have all that good a time, to tell you the truth. <laughs> we at least had that going for us. It's past time to get serious about rebuilding the economic base of this country. We have to stop making excuses for our poor economic performance for our inability to compete head to head with foreign producers. We have to stop telling ourselves it's OK every time we lose yet another market because the computer industry or some other industry we haven't yet lost will save us, or because we're becoming a service economy, a post-industrial state. What we are experiencing is not the evolution of an economy comparable to what happened when we stopped being mainly an agricultural society and became an industrialized country. That's the analogy that's often given. You know, They say, well, in the past, we went from being agricultural to industrial. That was the first step. And now we're going the next step from industrial to post-industrial to a service economy. But that's not what's going on at all. When we made the transition from an agricultural society, mainly, to an industrialized nation, there was a tremendous growth in agricultural efficiency that pushed people off the farms and a tremendous growth in industrial productivity that pulled them into higher paying jobs in an expanding industrial sector. What we are seeing now is people being pushed out of an industrial sector that is contracting because it's become relatively inefficient and is therefore losing markets. And they're being pulled into, those of them that get any jobs, into lower paying jobs in a not very productive service sector. This is not progressive economic evolution. It's regressive economic decay, and it's time to turn things around. There is no serious prospect of getting the US economy back on a long-term viable growth path without a dramatic increase in the rate of civilian commercial technological progress. And this cannot be done without a major infusion of engineering and scientific talent into the civilian sector. There is no domestic source of enough technological talent to make this happen, available in less than a generation, but the military sector. Pleasant or unpleasant, that's the reality. Fortunately, we now find ourselves in an international situation so much improved 
that we have little reason to maintain anything near the level of military spending in general, or military research and development in particular, that we have maintained in the past half century. What appears to us to be a difficult economic problem, what to do with all the people and facilities that are no longer needed in the military sector, is actually an exciting economic opportunity. It's nevertheless true that the process of economic conversion, taking people and facilities through the transition from a military-oriented to civilian-oriented activity, is not a simple process. It will not automatically be handled by the market. There is a wall between the military and civilian sectors. In many ways, they are different worlds. That is especially true both for managers and for research and development activities. The military sector is a performance-driven, relatively cost-insensitive sector. The products that come out of the military sector have to be capable of extreme performance under unusually hostile operating conditions. People are, after all, shooting at the product. It has to be able to operate in the desert one day, in a dusty environment, in a humid environment the next day, in a jungle the next day, in cold climates the next day. It's operating conditions of vibration and shock and stress and environmental uh, dirt and so on that are very difficult for a product. And the product itself has to perform to extreme capabilities because the perception is that if you can make a fighter plane that climbs a little more sharply or that goes a little faster, that will give you a critical advantage in a battle. Therefore, the performance stress is enormous in the military sector. But cost is not a critical consideration. The rule has been, if you can make it perform, do it, we'll pay, whatever it costs. The civilian sector is almost exactly the opposite. Their cost is critical. The key to producing people, th rather the key is producing products people want at a low enough price to be affordable and competitive. Products must perform well. But it's not necessary that every conceivable increment of performance be squeezed out of the product. And in general, civilian products operate under much less hostile operating conditions. Think of it in simple terms. Your refrigerator, your television set, doesn't have to re-enter the atmosphere. It doesn't get shot at. It doesn't have to be able to work outside in the dirt. You know, it's operating under much more normal conditions. And nobody really cares if the refrigerator can cool two-tenths of a second faster or even a minute faster. It's not really important, especially if it's expensive. You know, I encountered once when I was buying a refrigerator, an example just popped into my head, uh, maybe about eight or 10 years ago. Two refrigerators side by side, they seemed to have the same cooling capacity, the same energy efficiency, and so on. One of them was $150 more expensive. So I called over the, uh, the salesperson, and I said, why is this machine more expensive? And they said, oh, well, it's made with space age plastics, you know, from the space program. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, that's it. You know, it's made with this, and it's expensive. So I said, my refrigerator isn't going to have to re-enter the atmosphere. <laughs> I'll take the cheaper machine. And I think that's how consumers naturally behave. So if you're going to make that transition, you see these differences, among others, uh, between the military and the civilian sector in its mode of operation have tremendous impact on the day-to-day -day functioning of engineers, scientists, and of managers, depending on which business they're in. For example, military sector engineers are able to use the most exotic materials. And they have to specify, when designing products, very exact tolerances. What that means is, when an engineer, for instance, if an engineer is designing a product and there's a, a rod in the product that has to be two inches long, some, the engineer has to say this rod has to be two inches long. That's a specification known as a spec in short. But they also know that it doesn't have to be exactly two inches long, so they'll write a tolerance. They'll say plus or minus a tenth of an inch, a hundredth of an inch, a thousandth of an inch, which means how close you have to get to exactly two inches for it to work right. Well, in the military sector, engineers and scientists are used to designing with very narrow tolerances because of the extremes of 
operating conditions and performance requirements. To say it in very simple terms, things have to fit together very well. Everything has to be very precise. So they're used to specifying with very, very narrow tolerances. If you take the same engineer and you say de design a refrigerator, it has a two inch rod in the refrigerator, they'll make the same narrow tolerance because that's what they're used to. And they don't even, they know that works. And they don't even know what difference it makes to manufacturing cost to say plus or minus a ten thousandth of an inch instead of saying plus or minus a hundredth of an inch. But it makes a huge difference because if you have a very narrow tolerance, you're going to cut some of those rods a hair too small and you have to throw them out. And some of them will be a hair too long and you're going to have to rework them, which is expensive. And you're going to need more expensive equipment to machine them that precisely. If you don't need that degree of precision, you shouldn't specify it. But if you don't even know what the relationship is between the tolerance, the margin of error, and the cost of manufacturing the rod, how can you take it into account? Military sector engineers don't know because they don't need to know. It's not part of their business. And the same thing is true with specifying materials. I'll give you a quick example. Grumman Aerospace once decided to go into the business of producing solar panels for people's houses. Now, solar panels for the roof, pretty simple business. It's a glass sandwich, basically, with a copper tube you run water through. Put a black backing on it, absorbs a lot of heat, heats up the water running through the tube, it's a simple solar panel, and it sits on somebody's roof. So the engineers, the aerospace engineers designing this, specified titanium for the material to be used for the frame because it's strong and it's lightweight and they're used to dealing with titanium. Well, titanium is perfectly fine except it's extremely expensive. Aluminum is just fine, you know, saving another few ounces doesn't mean anything when the thing is sitting on somebody's roof. But you're not used to working with this material, you're used to working with that material, you know it works well, so you say, let's, let's use that. The result was they produced solar panels that were so expensive nobody could buy them. And they concluded from that that they couldn't make a civilian product. But you see, that's wrong. That's a very common conclusion, and it's wrong. Because what it means is that people cannot be expected to move between these two worlds without some retraining and reorientation. It's not that their engineers were dumb or foolish. It's just that they didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know this new business they had to operate in. And the same thing is true with managers. Um, about a year ago, I had a lengthy conversation with Ross Perot in his office, just way before the presidential craziness and so on that went on. And I, I wanted to talk to him about conversion issue for various reasons I won't go into now. And when I started to talk about the issue, Ross looked at me and he said, you know, he said, there's something wrong with what you're saying. I wouldn't let a manager from a military company anywhere near a civilian company that I owned. What the hell are you talking about? And I said to him, look, Ross, I understand what you're saying, and I'm telling you why it doesn't work. But you also know that those people are bright, they're capable, and they certainly can learn how to look at their job of managing from a different angle. And then he asked me what they would need to know. And we talked about it. You know, and after a long discussion, he said, yeah, I guess you could do that. Well, of course you can do that. We're not made out of stone. People can learn things. Sometimes people have said to me, this can't be as big a problem as you're saying. Engineering is engineering. Managing is managing. What difference does it make what kind of company it is, what kind of product it is? So I thought long and hard about how to make this clear. And I finally came up with an example that seems to work for most people. For more than 20 years now, I've been a university professor. I've taught undergraduates and graduate students in two different disciplines over time. I have a lot of experience of teaching. And let's assume I can do it you know, reasonably well. Suppose that somebody came to me and said, next week, we want you to start teaching second grade in an elementary school. Right? It's teaching. Teaching is teaching. Right? I'm a teacher. If I'm a good teacher, I should be able to do it. But the thing is com completely different context. I can't walk into a second grade class and say, hi, kids, read chapter four for next week. You know, we'll talk about it. I, I can't do things like that. 
And I'll give you another simple example. If I walk into my, my classroom at the university and I notice somebody seems to be upset, you know, somebody's got an expression, a little depressed or something like that, I might say something to them. I might say, you're okay. I might not. But in any case, it's not my business. But if I'm a second grade teacher and I see my kids are upset, I have to know why. I have to help because otherwise they won't learn. And it, they're not old enough to take full responsibility for their lives. So it's, of course it's teaching, just like teaching at the university, but in another sense it's profoundly different. That's why I use the term reorientation as well as retraining. These engineers and managers have to learn not just some different skills, they do need a few different skills, but they also have to learn a fundamentally different way of looking at what they're doing and at the goals of what they're doing in order to do it properly. And with that kind of retraining, they can make the transition and make it well. I want to take just a few minutes now uh, to talk about something kind of different. Um, well, perhaps I should first say something about the, the process of planning and conversion. Let me give you a historical example and show the relevance for it, and then I'll, I want to talk about something a little bit more, uh, perhaps a little more esoteric, but I think very important to keep in mind. In the year following, in the year following World War II, some 30% of the American GNP was shifted from military to civilian production in one year without causing the unemployment rate to rise above 3%. The conventional wisdom is that that transition happened automatically as the result of natural market forces propelled by pent-up demand, unsatisfied demand for consumer products built up during the war because of rationing. Well, pent-up demand was clearly important, but there was a great deal of advanced planning done by all levels of government and by the private sector in preparation for that reconversion. As early as 1943, many state and city governments set up agencies to plan post-war public works projects, to plan aid to private businesses, and to do vocational training. The GI Bill of Rights played an important role in providing benefits that allowed many of those who had been in the military to get the kind of training and education that they would otherwise not have been able to afford. And not coincidentally, the GI Bill of Rights is one of the best investments we ever made in this country's history. It paid back to the federal government in extra tax revenue, just in this narrow calculation, extra tax revenue collected from people earning more because they were higher trained, 30 times what the program cost. 30 times what the program cost. That's what an investment of the right sort in education can do for an economy and for a government. That's not a bad return on investment. Private national business organizations like the US Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers, not exactly radical groups, published reconversion planning reports as early as 1943. There was a private business group called the Committee for Economic Development that had 40,000 business people on local economic development committees throughout the country to assist business in planning early post-war production. In general, government at all levels assisted in retraining, took care of planning needed public works projects that could serve as civilian markets, and stimulated the economy as a whole. But private business did all of the micro-level company reconversion planning. At that time, weapons and related systems were being produced by civilian companies who turned to military production to support the war effort. That's why I referred to that shift as a reconversion. They were going back to business as usual for them. But today, most military sector organizations have never done anything but military-related business. For them, the military business is business as usual. The shift to civilian econ uh, activities is a move to entirely new territory for them. Yet I think the same basic mix of government and private sector responsibilities 
seems a good model for today. That is, the government should take care of uh, planning public works, of assisting and retraining, and so on. But the companies have to do the factory planning. It's a corporate planning job, not a government planning job. That kind of advanced planning, if we began it now, would help us to shift gears smoothly at the end of our 45 years <coughs> war, the Cold War. Perhaps we need something like another GI Bill of Rights, this time for military sector workers, to get them reconnected to civilian business. Well, I, I want to briefly now go into another thing entirely, and I'll say it only very quickly, but I think it's worth saying. One of the important things about talking about conversion, about the issue of conversion, is that it doesn't let you off the hook easily. You can argue to stop doing something, and that's a self-contained statement, but if you argue that something should be converted, it immediately raises the question, to what? And to what, to me, doesn't just mean what gizmo are we going to make at this factory. It also means what kind of economy, what kind of society do we want? Why, while we have to shift gears and aim ourselves in a different direction, why don't we think about what we really want to do? And so I want to, to argue to you that there are ways of using economic relationships, if they're properly structured, international economic relationships, to do a large part of the job that we previously have relied on military power to do. That is, to try to deal with international conflict and generate security for the country, for the nation. And I'm not going to talk, although it's part of the deal, it's a small part of the deal, I'm not going to talk about using economic sanctions in order to influence international behavior. That's a separate topic, but that's using a stick. What I'm going to talk about instead is the possibility of structuring economic relations in such a way as to provide positive incentives for nations to settle their disputes without shooting at each other. That's the issue. And I think you can build what I refer to as an international peacekeeping economy. I didn't say a peaceful economy, I said a peacekeeping economy. Based on four principles, four principles. The first one has to do with balancing independence and interdependence as national strategies. If everybody is dependent on external sources for the things they most critically need, that makes them very nervous. We fought a war in the Persian Gulf primarily because we were worried about critical external oil supplies. If we had had a higher level of independence with respect to these critical goods, we wouldn't get so nervous about changes happening elsewhere. Now, I'm not saying that that makes aggression OK. That's, a, that's not the case. But what I am saying is that countries that feel dependent on external sources for absolutely critical things like food and basic energy supply are liable to get very nervous whenever changes occur and to overreact and try to force access to whatever those resources are. So we need to build the independence of, of nations on critical goods, but at the same time, we need to maximize their interdependence economically on everything else. Because another thing that helps you to avoid conflict is knowing that you need the other guys and they need you. And that, that comes to the second principle, that economic relationships should be relatively balanced. If you build a relationship which is exploitative, all the benefit is flowing in one direction. It makes people angry. The people who are exploited are angry and ready to disrupt the relationship the first chance they get. And it's expensive for the exploiter. We don't usually think about that. But the exploiter has to maintain a lot of force and control and attention and effort to keeping that other party under their thumb. It sounds hard to believe, but Adam Smith, the founder of capitalism, argued to the British 200 years ago that the best thing that Britain could do for its own economy was to get rid of the colonies and stop trying to dominate the world. He argued that Britain should sever those relationships with the colonies and trade with them as equal partners, that that would be better for Britain, not just better for the colonies. 
because, he said, in order to maintain these colonies, we have to have a huge military, we have to have all these colonial government establishments. We're draining Britain to keep these people under our thumb. We'd all be better off if we'd stop doing it. I'm sure that Lenin would have had an interesting reaction to the fact that, Mar uh, that, uh, that Smith was an anti-imperialist, but that's a, that's a separate matter. Balanced relationships create incentives for peace. And I'll give you one quick example, the European common market. If you were to go onto the street of any of the dozen common market nations today and interview people and just ask them what they thought the odds of a war between their country and any other common market country you want to name are in the next 50 to 100 years, they would laugh at you. They would say, you must be crazy. What kind of a stupid question is that? They don't even think in those terms anymore. But look at the history of those 12 nations. You're talking about France and Germany and Britain and Belgium and the Netherlands. Those countries have fought countless wars with each other over the centuries. They don't even think about shooting anymore, and they still got plenty of conflicts. Why not? The simple answer, and there are many dimensions to the answer, but one of the critical things is that they've built a web of economic relationships among them that are balanced, essentially, and they all know that they have more to lose by disrupting those relationships than they could possibly compensate for even by winning a war against the other one. So they don't think that way anymore. There's something of a model in that for the world in general, for the 21st century. I think we can do a lot more with it. And I'll just quickly state two other principles. We need to pay more serious attention to development because the poverty and frustration of so many of the world's people are a breeding ground for conflict and war. They can light the spark that will ignite a world war again, let alone all these terribly devastating local wars that are going on. We must take development seriously. It's in everyone's interest to improve their conditions. You cannot fight poverty and frustration with bullets. It's as simple as that. The only way to deal with this problem is by serious attention to development. It's in all of our interests, in the interests of peace, in the interests of prosperity as well. And the fourth principle is we have to minimize ecological stress, because that also creates major sources of conflict from acute problems like Chernobyl, which generated a lot of hostility internationally, to chronic problems like acid rain, which has the United States and Canada screaming at each other from time to time, these long-term friends. We have to do something to avoid depleting our resources as rapidly and polluting ours and our environment as much. We can build an international economy focused on these basic principles. And conversion of our military sector opens up an opportunity to aim ourselves in a very productive direction now that can not only deal with the re-employment of the people coming out of the military sector, but at the same time improve our national prosperity and our international prospects for a more peaceful world. Let me try to bring this to a, a close now. The potential positive long-run economic impact of the shift in resources that conversion implies is enormous in scale and global in scope. Nationally, it's the cornerstone of undoing the economic deterioration that has reversed the long historic pattern of improving living standards in America. The infusion of critical resources from the military sector to the civilian is the key to rebuilding America's economic future and properly integrated with other development activities and guided by the principles of a peacekeeping international economy, it can create a powerful impetus to both economic prosperity and national security, to economic well-being on an international, national, and local level. The shift away from the military emphasis of the past is underway, and it should be sharply accelerated. Conversion offers a means to let us shift gears smoothly without serious disruption, but it isn't magic and it isn't without cost. It has to be properly planned and carefully implemented. It's a complex process 
that cannot be done quickly and still be done well. There is therefore little to lose and everything to gain by beginning the process of conversion now, before all the cutbacks have been made, before all the treaties have been signed. Let's do it now. The vision of a more prosperous, peaceful, and secure world has sustained humankind through some of the darkest hours of its history. And some of those darkest hours of our history have been in this century. Always there have been those who insisted that this dream was achievable. Always there have been those who held that it was nothing but a beautiful illusion. Our technological capacity developed rapidly. Our social and political maturity has lagged far behind. Increasingly, we put our faith in our ability to manipulate the physical world and depended for our security on our ability to threaten and forcefully coerce each other. Finally and inevitably, we placed in our own hands the capacity to bring the impressive history of our species to a quick and violent end. But just when it seemed like the cynics had won, a remarkable flowering of human freedom and creativity began. Nonviolent revolutions swept over a series of nations held firmly in the grasp of rigid authoritarianism. The violent antagonism of two powerful alliances of nations has melted away. An attempt to overthrow the new freedoms and reestablish an iron hand in the world's largest nation, the former Soviet Union, was beaten back by the commitment and determination of ordinary people who wouldn't let the dream die. The vision is reborn. There's still far too much anger, hatred, and antagonism in the world in weapons toward more productive and life-enhancing activities. In all of this, conversion has a critical role to play. The real peace dividend lies in making these changes, and conversion is the mechanism through which we can begin the radical change in direction to which history now calls us. <laughs>